yeah, he weighed 615, and he was a lot, very long baby. And, um, yeah, he was a good little kid. Um, no problems with him. Uh, not till later on when he, you know, became a young man or a young boy. Um, well, he was a prankster, and he, um, well, when he was really young, he refused to eat vegetables. He hated vegetables. And now that's all he eats. <laughs> it's just a little surprising. Um, yeah, he used to do pranks on me when he got to be a little bit older. Like, he put a, a bucket of water above the door to the laundry room. And um, I'd walk through and the water would fall down on me. And um, he always had his drums down our basement. And he was a really good drummer. We went to see him play a few occasions. And I thought he should have pursued that, but he didn't. Um, yeah, it, he's a great kid. Um, I love him very, very much. And I'm sorry that a lot of the stuff that he went through in his past, that should never have happened, so. So on our hike, we're gonna be going down the metal stairway and all along the river, Way down there, see right down as far as you can see with the water, that's where the whirlpool is. So we're going to be hiking down along the river, up to where the whirlpool, whirlpool is, and then up the stair, up the pathway, and the stairs back up to the top. I grew up in Niagara Falls, I was born here, and uh, here in the Niagara Gorge is where I would come hiking with my brother Derek and friends. We've been down here many times and it's very beautiful, so anytime visitors come to Niagara Falls, I'd love to go for a hike in the gorge. I, what I like about nature is it's the reason I'm alive. <laughs> you know, I, I, I am nature and I love myself and I look at it like we're all one. It seems to me we're all one and we do everything together. We help together, we hurt together, we do it all together. So all my videos, I feel like the universe made them as a whole. And I've just been had a front row seat watching them all unfold. And so we're all nature, I'm nature. And then uh, I love nature also because just I, I do have a habit of looking at screens too much. I spend quite a bit on time, you know, during the pandemic being alone and missing community. I've been spending a lot of time on the internet. So when I get out into nature like this, I'm not looking at a screen. I'm just in the real world and it's very beautiful. And I think it's very important to spend time away, look away from screens, take a screen fast sometimes if you can and be, be with friends, uh, be with animals. I went vegan in 1998. A coworker of mine at the time said, hey, John, did you know that eating animals has been linked to cancer? And I went to the library to look this up. And in the vegetarian vegan section, I saw a book called Old McDonald's Factory Farm. And I was very curious about that. So I started reading and I learned about all the horrors of animal agribusinesses, about little chicks being z beaks so they wouldn't, I, that would limit the amount of damage they could cause to their fellow chickens in their battery cages because their beaks are cut off. So when they get frustrated and they're pecking at each other, they can't damage, damage the, the property so much. And I learned about how, you know, mother cows have to be impregnated in order to give milk and then their babies are taken away in crops of veal farms and murdered for veal. And I learned about pigs getting their tail docking, you know, getting their tails cut off. And I've learned about all the horrors. And I, I learned that we don't need to eat animals. We humans are not obligate carnivores. We can get all, nutri all their nutrients from plant foods. The only supplement I take is vitamin B12 and then some vitamin D in the winter time. The first time I ever got drunk, I'm, I'm straight edge and so I don't consume any uh, alcohol or recreational drugs. And, but I did experiment a tiny bit. I, when I was 17 years old, I was a dishwasher at Pizza Hut. 
and the night before I was at a house party and there was uh, some drink uh, with vodka and orange juice and I just tried a, a couple glasses and and it tasted like orange juice but yeah I could tell obviously there was vodka in it and then I got I got drunk and then the next day I was a dishwasher at Pizza Hut and I, I vomited in the toilet at work because I was hungover and I didn't like that at all. I didn't even like the feeling of getting drunk. I uh, and so, and I don't like the taste of alcohol. And I had some uh, family members who got a little nasty when they drank alcohol when I was a child. So I, it sort of turned me off alcohol for life. So I'm really glad uh, that, that I, I live simply like I just like, you know, plant foods and have, if I have water to drink and that's all I need. I don't need any, anything else. brings back lots of memories. This is the neighborhood where I grew up and I had a, I had a super fun childhood. Lots of uh, neighborhood friends like Matt Pierce and Sean Moore and uh, my siblings and we uh, played lots of hockey. We played road hockey on this street here and uh, all the time. It was super duper fun. And so we also played ice hockey. We made a backyard ice rink every year and so I just stepped on the snow to flatten it all down and then flood the backyard with a garden hose. And then one little unfortunate incident happened where there was a neighborhood kid from school who wasn't very good at skating, so, so to amuse himself, he swung his hockey stick around like a helicopter. And he smacked me in the mouth really hard, and its tooth loosened and almost fell out. But then years later, it stayed in my mouth, but then years later, a chip came off and it needed a root canal and there was damage. So now I have a removable tooth, and, and it reminds me of my grandmother who had a prosthetic leg. You know, grandma had a removable body part, now I do too. I have this tooth that comes out. <laughs> and hey, I don't mind, I'm just glad to still be alive. So, this is also the, the neighborhood I lived in when I started playing drums at age 16. And I had a lot of fun with that, but I, I, I wasn't allowed to play when my stepfather was home, so, because he, he was loud. So I would play when he was out. And so I'd play drums, but also we had a, a next door neighbor who complained a lot about the noise. She said that the vibrations of me drumming were so powerful, it made pictures fall off her wall. And she couldn't even hear like her friend talking on the phone with her. She couldn't hear the TV. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. The drumming wasn't that loud. But I'm grateful I got a chance to have drums under the roof at all. And uh, you know, it, it led to a, a wonderful life of making music. Right here, there used to be a house and that was the, where I grew up. That was my childhood home. And it was lots of fun. My grandmother and my grandfather and my Aunt Sue and my Uncle Rick lived in this house right here. And so it was lots of fun living right next door to my grandma. And she was a, a really fun person. She had a prosthetic leg. She lost her leg, one of her legs, right below the knee. I, after a tobogganing accident, gangrene said it said to amputate one of her legs. And so, Sometimes at backyard parties, uh, she would drink, drink beer out of her prosthetic leg, which I thought was funny. So West Lane Secondary School is where I went to high school and I was quite a shy student. In fact, one time I remember in, a, I think it was history class, I had to do an oral presentation. And then so I delivered it and I was very nervous. I was just like looking at my speech the whole time, basically reading it. And then I finished and I sat down and I heard one student say to another student, I didn't know he could talk. So that's how quiet I was. And so I, uh, I was often too shy to even eat my lunch in the uh, cafeteria. So I would just go into a cubicle in the library and eat my lunch there. So I, yeah, I never went to any football games or like school dances or anything. Some years I didn't even bother go to go to get my yearbook photo taken. So I don't know why, but yeah, back then I was just a very, very shy kid. I had a lot of fun here. Uh, I have lots of wonderful memories. I remember at track and field day, I was really awesome at the triple jump. That was my specialty. And I remember getting first place, I, a ribbon in the triple jump a few years. I, and I really, my favorite classes were art and music. And I have one funny memory where 
the teacher, the music teacher, Mr. Holmes, I remember he had the whole class sing and he would listen to each of us individually because he was picking out certain students to be in the class choir. And he came up to me and he listened to me saying, no, and then he went to the next student. So it's kind of funny that Mr. Holmes, rest in peace, was the first person to learn that I'm a bad singer way before everybody on YouTube learned it. I remember that it was pretty strict back then and I remember uh, the grade four teacher, he told us, because he had too many kids wanting to go to the bathroom during class, and he said, he's very adamant, only use the bathroom during recess. But one day I forgot to go during recess, so in grade four, I had to go so bad, and I was holding it and holding it, and finally I urinated in my pants right there in my seat. And then we had a spelling bee, and I had to stand up and pull my shirt down so no one saw it, and thankfully no one saw it. But it, it's sad when you think of children being that afraid of the students. So I hope it's better for kids nowadays where I, you know, students aren't so afraid to go to the bathroom and things like that. My brother Derek lived here for about 10 years and then he recently uh, moved in with his partner so I took over his apartment. So I don't know how long I'll live here. It's a new thing to me paying rent after couch surfing for six years and not having to pay rent. Uh, so, but I'll be very productive with music while I'm here and write a lot of instrumentals and then later on well, if I'm traveling again I can use those instrumentals for new songs. So, I, well this is something new that I built a, a vocal booth out of uh, some two by fours that were in my brother Derek's backyard and then I got some moving blankets. I learned on YouTube how to make a vocal booth. And I mainly made this because in the summertime, the air conditioning was on a lot and just for recording vocals, it was kind of loud, but it's, it's quieter now, now this time of year without the air conditioning on. So there's the vocal booth. And then some instruments, there's a, a music keyboard. I, sometimes I'll use this for writing. I'll try to figure out the melody, even if you don't hear the keyboard in a song, I'm using the piano to try and figure out a vocal melody. And then sometimes I'll record the vocal melody. Then when I record vocals, I'll follow it along like training wheels. And that'll help me stay in tune. And then uh, I used to play drums in bands. Um, when I learned how to play drums when I was 16. And yeah, I used to play drums in heavy metal hand bands. And I had long hair and I loved it. And I, so yeah, some electronic drums so they're not so loud for the neighbors. And then there's some guitars here. I like to put social justice messages on my guitars, so uh, I, I, I have some more stickers I'm gonna put on stuff, but uh, decolonize this place. I, I'm always working on decolonizing my mind. And uh, ask me about prison abolition. I'm really passionate about prison abolition. Yes, and then there's a toaster oven because the oven doesn't work, so I have that if you need to bake something. And then my brother very kindly, uh, he gave me this blender. Uh, oh, sorry, I bought it for him for a low price because he got bored with it and he didn't really use it much, so I got a really good deal on that. Hello, this video was on YouTube and last night I deleted it because someone wrote a comment and they said, John, this video has cannibalistic undertones. And I got freaked out. I thought, maybe it does because I was licking the papaya as if I were licking a woman. And then I started to eat the papaya, but I'm not a, a cannibal, absolutely not. I have been with a woman and you know, maybe like nibbled a little bit on her neck or her inner thighs or something rather, but absolutely I am not into cannibalism. So, so yeah, I deleted the video, but then people were saying, John, why'd you delete it? We know you're not a cannibal. And so I thought I'd upload the video again with a little introduction. So please, no cannibalism. We must be kind to everyone and be vegan. So this is just a silly little harmless video. And I, I, in the video, I was licking the papaya. And yes, I was pretending I was licking a woman. But the papaya, after so much licking, it was just so delicious. I just, I just started biting it. But yeah, don't worry if, if I'm ever intimate with you. I'm not going to start eating you. Maybe just gentle nibbling. And that, that's it. Okay. Say no to cannibalism. Say yes to veganism. Hello, John Sacker is here, taking a bath. Yeah, that's right, I'm bare naked. Yeah, this was at a friend's house in Toronto, and I, I still have that, that wig. Sitting in the bathtub all by myself. Mm, what a shame. I'd love to take a bath with you. 
You could help clean my back, and I could help clean your back. I'd be more than happy to help clean other parts of your body, too. I made a whole series of videos in the bathtub. I thought it was very intimate and, and funny. Like, you don't often see someone sitting in the bathtub uh, making a video. And it was a way to peel two, sorry, I uh, cut two carrots with one knife or lay two candles with one flame where I made a video and I took about at the same time. So, got two things accomplished but at once. Right now I'm all by myself and my tongue feels like cleaning something. So maybe I'll clean this. Papaya, this sexy, sexy papaya with my tongue. Mm. And while I'm licking this papaya, I'll fantasize that you, sexy vegan woman, are sitting on my face. Because that is my ultimate fantasy to have a vegan woman sit on my face. Oh. And I don't know that, like some say vegans taste better, and maybe that's true. I don't know if any uh, peer-reviewed scientific studies are out about that, like taste comparisons or whatever, I don't know. But uh, the fact that I would find vegans more attractive is because they share my values. It's the men mental. They know, they, they know about the same sort of things that I know about, and they speak out against that oppression. And there's a, a, connect, a connection, and also, it is less attractive being with someone I think. I haven't kissed a non-vegan, but just the idea of kissing someone and knowing that there's maybe flesh from murdered animals stuck between their teeth and all that, and, and just knowing what they've used, that they've used their mouth to chew up my friends, it's, it's kind of, it is very disturbing. One time, I, it was at uh, the Toronto Pride Parade and a bunch of activists, animal rights activists there, we were t there to march in the parade and we had our signs for, you know, lit leaflets and stuff and signs for animal rights. And so one of the activists there recognized me and she, she said, I know who you are and I'm not a fan. And she said, vegan vagina juice? And she said, you're objectifying women. And I felt really bad because she, you know, she was obviously very concerned and, and thought I was objectifying women, and that was horrifying to me because I would never ever want to do that. And then she loudly went around the group, "This guy, I, he objectifies women. He's, it's disgraceful what he's doing." And then uh, everyone was just shocked to see this person yelling. And then so I, I calmly explained to her, "I, I, I, I hear you. I hear what you're saying." Um, my intention was certainly never to objectify anyone and I uh, you know I, I've seen like a bumper sticker that says uh, vegans taste better and so uh, and I thought hey I uh, you know as a heterosexual man maybe I'll, I'll write a song uh, about vegan vagina juice and so I had good intentions just to uh, you know make like a, a funny cute song about uh, you know there's certainly nothing wrong with uh, with between consenting adults, you know, licking each other. And so I thought it was just a fun, sexy song to me. And uh, so, yeah, it was never my intention to objectify anyone. And I, I have had many women say they like the song and they think it's, it's funny. So I've really, I don't own, I only remember over the years, just the one person who, who was really angry about it and said I objectified women. But so after she, she finally left and then all the other activists, they, they later came up to me and said, you know, sorry for not speaking up when she was yelling at you, but, uh, you know, and then I, I did the march with everyone and it was a really great time, outreach for the, with the, for the animals. my favorite view of Niagara Falls right here where you can stand right by the brink of the falls and watch the water go over. And so I worked on the boats, the boats that we'll see down in the river there. I, I worked there for about seven or eight seasons and gone for thousands of boat rides. 
And I saw some interesting things when I worked down there. For instance, it's the first time I'd ever seen a body floating in the water. I'd only been there a few days and sometimes the captains would say, be on the lookout for a package and that meant a body. So sometimes people would yeah, go over the falls and die. And so I saw a body just floating there in the water, really stiff and, and uh, yeah, very sad to see. And then they called the cops. The cops came down and picked up the young, the young person. And then uh, some other interesting things I saw one time, I was on the boat and a guy had tried to kayak over Niagara Falls in a red kayak. And so I was on the boat and I saw a kayak with no one in it going right by the boat. And uh, so people, tourists heard about that. This guy who, he thought he could do it, kayak over the falls, but he died. And his body, from what I heard, was never found. But uh, yeah, I went for too many boat rides. You can only handle so many thousands of boat rides before I just wanted to get out of there and go somewhere else. But, uh, but it's still, even though I've seen the falls so many times, it's still beautiful to look at. Oh, John, like, well, like, no. I told him many times when, when he was 10, 11, 12, whatever, I, uh, I knew he was never gonna walk, you know how people walk uh, either a straight line or they go left or they go right. Do you know what I mean? And I knew that he was never going to walk the straight line, and I knew he would either go left or go right. He could either be shooting people from a high tower, or he could be the Prime Minister of Canada. So, I mean, I knew he was, uh, there was something uh, uh, unique about him. Uh, uh, he was somewhat shy, a little reserved, uh, and, uh, you know, amazed how far he has come with uh, his public speaking and all that stuff he does. Uh, but he, when he was younger, he was a little on the shy side. I think he had a lot of responsibility with the kids there. He was the oldest of the four. So I think some of that weighed on him. But, uh, 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 you know, you ask an old guy to remember 40 years ago, 30 years, 5, 40, yeah, 35, 40 years ago. The biggest thing, as I say, is I knew that he was going to be unique. He's going to be one of a kind who were, you know, one of the few. a reference photo that I'm going to sing of Diane and the turkey and uh, I did this this painting here of Diane well well Dan was still alive and uh, yeah, Diane died over a year ago uh, because of complications after his surgery and Dan was heartbroken and uh, after Diane passed away I did this painting of her uh, and it's uh, it's for her wearing a shirt that says "I'm from the Vegan." And then uh, she like she did a lot of activism with a group called Direct Action Everywhere with all the blue shirts. So that's you know it's just a bunch of different things. Like she she helped rescue a turkey, so there's a turkey here, and uh, she liked moths, so there's a moth and some flowers. And then so I mailed this to Dan, and he loved it. And then he said uh, he was very obviously heartbroken of having his partner of over 30 years. I uh, passed away. So one thing that he was uh, excited about was he wanted to work on making a memorial wall in the home that they shared. And so he, uh, he, I, I mailed this painting to him so he could have it on the memorial wall. So then, so for the memorial wall, Dan commissioned me. He really liked this painting, uh, or this picture of Diane with a turkey. So. Uh, I've, I've only put a day's effort into it so far, but it's, it's off to a pretty good start. So, uh, but because Diane, uh, Dan, he hung on for a year after Diane passed away, and Dan had some mental health issues with, uh, like, you know, depression and anxiety, and, and Diane was like his rock or his anchor, and he really helped her emotionally. Diane was Dan's emotional support human and so he would felt really lost and sad without without her in the world anymore and so he hung on for about a year and then I saw the death certificate and it says on it that witnesses saw Dan jump in front of a train and so I guess he had enough of uh, I don't know what his mental where he was mentally when that happened maybe he was just having an episode or something and, but yeah, now he's passed away, so now I miss Diane and Dan. But they're still alive in my heart and in my mind, and I have so many memories. I knew they were older than I am, and I knew that you know people aren't around forever. So I, I'm really lucky. I, I went to California 
and, and stayed with them several times and we had many adventures together and memory, many memories. So I could still hear their voices in my head very easily. And uh, they were such a lovely, 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 lovely couple and they were so nice to me and I cherish all the memories. So they are still alive in a way because they exist in the hearts and the minds of many people around the world. And they still are alive on the internet. Just the other day I got a, mess a comment from someone and he, it was under the don't insult video that I made with Dan and Diane. That's the one that went really, really viral. And uh, and the message was, I'm working at a slaughterhouse and I'm watching this video. And I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, if, you know, it's pretty awesome to think that someone would be at a slaughterhouse. And, but still getting vegan seeds planted by Dan and Diane over the internet. So I think that's cool. And I have empathy for all the workers. I want them all to have a better life. So I hope one day soon all slaughterhouse workers can quit. Because that's a horrible, horrible job, you know, killing animals. No one wants to spend their life doing that. topic I feel very passionately about that I've been wanting to write about is how capitalism makes life unnecessarily confusing. So like under capitalism, okay, hey, I need a place to live, I need food. Well, okay, we'll get a job. Okay, well, what jobs are available? Oh, you can work at a casino or whatever. And uh, it just makes life ne unnecessarily confusing that you have to get money somehow every month. So why don't, why not just make food and housing free for everyone and then all jobs can be done by volunteers, you know. Oh, I like to paint, great, we have a tiny house community, you can help paint the walls, or, or uh, this is a community garden, you can volunteer there and get food, so. And uh, one website I really like to use when I'm, well, uh, when I'm writing songs is, yeah, just any kind, any, there's a different ones, a rhyming website. So let's see, like I wrote, uh, Capitalism makes life unnecessarily confusing. So let's see what rhymes with confusing. I know this is very embarrassing. I never learned how to properly type, so I type with two fingers. <laughs> We're pretty fast at typing with two fingers. So we have a whole bunch of words that rhyme, rhyme, rhyme with uh, confusing, like choosing. I like that word. Uh, well, you know, an easier system we could all be choosing. Oops. Our fellow beings, we have no right to be using. Our, the biosphere we cannot afford to be losing. Oh, I'll write that for now, I might end up changing it later. Anything can be changed. So I like that so far. Capitalism makes life unnecessarily confusing. An easier system we could all be choosing. Our fellow beings we have no right to be using. The biosphere we can't afford to be... I wrote using, I meant to write losing. Oops. The biosphere we can't afford to be losing. Okay, so I think that's good so far. And so I just have to come up with some verses. Or who knows, sometimes I think, like, maybe that'll end up, maybe sometimes I'll come up with something even catchier for, not that that's su super catchy, but I'll some come up with something really catchy for a chorus, so maybe that'll end up being a verse. Because I'm a sister, the sexy ones that he does, I don't want to, <laughs> because I'm a sister, and I'll be like, it's like any of my brothers, if they say anything, I'm just like, ah, uh, like, I don't want to hear it. But, um, but yeah, no, those type of videos, nah, but everything else, yeah, I, I, I watch it. Like, um, my son, uh, told all of Stanford High School about, uh, the fingers. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. Uh, my fingers are bored. They want something to do. And then he goes, tickle, 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 right? But my son took this song to his school and everybody was singing it caught on. 
So I mean, he has good spirited songs as well, right? Yes, I'm very proud of John. I think anyone who can stay true to you and be unapologetically yourself in a world that if you're not the norm or you're slightly different or you are not part of the sheep, then you are sometimes ostracized or treated like there's something wrong with you. John is a brilliant person. I'm proud to call him my brother because he's a good big brother. And he taught me that not to be afraid to be myself. You know, that's a pretty big lesson to teach somebody that looks up to you for the last, you know, I'm going to be 41 in December. So, you know, it's, it's, he's never wavered. He, he, once he broke through the mold after high school and became him, that was it. And I think it takes all the courage in the world sometimes to just be who you are, which is sad because you should just be accepted, period. John's an amazing drummer. He is very, he can actually do the stick tricks and the, he uh, had little mirrors all stuck to his drums so the lights would reflect off of it. He was a lot of fun. Um, and he was always very encouraging. Like I was young at the time, so I'd go up on a stage and I'd start singing and <laughs> John, even if I came close, like I thought I was gonna forget the words or whatever, I would just look over at John and John would make eye contact with me like, you got this. And this one goes out to my mom because I know she loves the way I sing this song, so. Yeah. I love the way you sing it too. Thank you. While still holding a beat. <laughs> like, he just, um, he was very, very supportive or whenever we were at jam, like band practice and we were jamming together, um, he would always encourage me, no, you can hit that note or you can do this or, you know. I'm kind of sad that he doesn't drum anymore because I really think he could have made it. But this was, his passion wasn't there. His, he lo loves music. He loves to play music. He loves to create, he, but he wants to do it on his terms. He wants to do it the way he wants to do it, right? And I think that's amazing too. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of sad he doesn't do it as much though. Because I, th I, I do think he was good enough he could have made it. Years ago, I decided to do uh, stand-up comedy for a while. And John decided he was going to go and do comedy that night too. But John can't do normal comedy. He can't just go and tell jokes. So what he did was he did a whole comedy routine in animal noises. He went to animal court and he fell down a hole and he was trying animal court. So it was all animals making noises, the whole thing. And it was just very, very bizarre to see how creative he could be on stage. And it was like, when he was done, the crowd wasn't, they didn't know what to do. They all just stood there in silence for a while going like, cause they couldn't really believe what he had just done. So because he tried, he decided to try, he, John's always been to try new things. So that to him to do comedy in front of like, comedy is a very tough thing to do. And it's very nervous to be up there. Cause if I'm doing a speech, I don't expect a reaction from people. But when you're telling jokes and people don't laugh, it's, it's, I've been there. It's the loneliest feeling in the world. When you tell your best joke and you get a silent room, you get kind of panicking. So for him to have enough, oh, another one outside. So John was going to air college. John had to do a speech on the way to the, to the speech. He threw up on the bus. He was so nervous. Now I'm very confident if John was in front of 10,000 people, he would do a performance without even being nervous for five seconds. So he's very, he's come a long way in his life as be more extroverted and more out in the public than he used to be. I, I think that he's very creative and he's got a way of expressing a message that might not be palatable to a lot of people in a funny and engaging way. Some of his stuff is a little much for me. I can't, I'm not comfortable knowing John watching some of his videos makes me uncomfortable but like the the ones that he did with dan and diane and the like cartoonish vegan songwriting um and then his jesus songs because i'm a reforming catholic so his jesus songs are great he's very talented i just can't watch the youtube videos that are really intensely personal they make me a little uncomfortable. He's so open to anyone's point of view and he's so welcoming and um, like to try to see someone's humanity. And he's just like really positive to be around. He gives me a good feeling to be around him. Um, we I haven't known him that long. We've only been four, four years. years, four and four years and a bit. Um, so my interactions with him have always been him explaining some kind of opinion or position or trying out material and then me responding or challenging or disagreeing and we end up talking for two or three hours and then it's time to go home so 
I just look forward to more, more than just looking back at the memories. I look forward to the future. I have a very, very busy life. So actually sitting down to take time to watch John's videos is hard. My kids are very young and they're sports and, and I work full time. My wife works full time too. So it's just never really, when I have free time, it's to do something else than watch John's videos, unfortunately. <laughs> hey T-Bone, you eat animals? Yep. What? <laughs> <laughs> I look up to John because I envy his way of life sometimes. I wish that I could just go crash on someone's couch and have no responsibilities whatsoever, but unfortunately I can't because I brought children in the world, so now I have to be responsible for more than just myself. Uh, proud of John? I guess I am. He's a good person, and he means no harm, and he wants to make the world a better place, so yeah, I can say I'm proud of him. From my last four jobs, I worked as a hotel room attendant, and it's a hard job. The rooms have to be spotless, not a single speck of dust or crumb or fingerprints or pubic hair anywhere. And you only have so many minutes to do this, and sometimes there was a big party in the room, or there were children making a big mess, and like families making a big mess. And uh, they work you very hard, and we all know why they work you so hard is because Profit is the unpaid labor of the working class. So the harder you work, they work you for the lowest amount of money possible, the more profit they make. So the last hotel ad I worked the last hotel I worked at, I made minimum wage. And tips are practically non-existent too. You know, very small. I remember one time I did get a big tip. It was $20 and all day I was happy. Wow, I got a $20 tip. And then near the end of the day, House, head of housekeeping called and said, hey John, somebody left a $20 bill in, bill in one of the rooms. Can you bring it, bring it down? So, <laughs> so I brought it back down and yeah, it turned out I didn't get a tip after all. But I, I dream of a post-capitalist world with total freedom and all jobs can be done by volunteers. So we don't need to be working people so hard. You know, making a profit is unethical. Everything should be non-profit. And uh, you know, all jobs can be done by volunteers. And then there are some, of course, classic books like uh, Anne Frank, The Diary of a Young Girl. And I would love to show you also the VR headset I got because that was a very powerful experience I had where Anne Frank and her family, they were the, the place where they were uh, for what was it, two years? Where they hid from the Nazis? That's on VR. So I put on the VR headset and that was one of the places I was allowed to go because they went into where the actual place where her family hid. They went in there with VR cameras and film. So when I put on the VR headset, it blew my mind. I, I felt like I was really there. I was looking at the wallpaper on the wall and everything looked so real. I got a sense of feeling like I was there. So, you know, when you hear about people complaining about during the COVID-19 epidemic about having to stay home for a while, well, look what they had to do, stay in this little tiny place, uh, all cramped up together for years uh, to help keep themselves in the loved ones safe. for, you know, being there for the animals and that. Uh, he's, uh, there's some, um, I think they're funny and some of them are really well done, but then there's other ones that, well, 
you know, that's a little disturbing to me because I'm 74 years old, so, you know, something that we're unfamiliar with. But, yeah, he's he's a really, really good, kind-hearted person. I've always been proud of him. I think that um, a lot of people should take more interest in, you know, and go along certain lines. There's certain things that I disagree with, but I, I've never not been proud of them. Anything that happens to me in life, I try to find a bright side to it. And so there are some uh, memories I have from my childhood that made me never want to get into drinking alcohol. And so I look at alcohol as being poison. It's uh, really bad for my health. And so, yeah, and I don't, I waste, you know, I save a lot of money by not drinking alcohol. But the reason is because, yeah, I had some family members. Sure, there were some funny times, like with my grandmother drinking some beer out of her prosthetic leg. You know, that was fun. But then sometimes, you know, I saw some people behaving in such a way that they shouldn't have been behaving uh, because of, you know, they were drunk and they got a little violent with me and hit me. And uh, I am a very forgiving person. And uh, so it's all in the past. And uh, I get along well with everyone now. But uh, I, I know that I didn't deserve any of that. I know that uh, I never deserved to be treated like that. And no one deserves to be abused uh, physically or emotionally. Uh, but anyway, hey, if uh, one of the people maybe who hit me ever sees this documentary, I love you with all my heart, just as I love all beings on earth, and I want a world where everyone has all their needs met, and I, I you know, I, I forgive anyone who's ever harmed me, like whether it be someone who hit me when I was a child or someone who wrote na something nasty about me online, I forgive you. I think that everyone is doing their best. That's how I look at it. We're all products of our genetics and mainly our life experiences. So if someone got hurt, you know, hurt people hurt people. So if someone hurt me, I think, who hurt them? What happened to them during their childhood? Even though my singing, even if it is bad, I think what it is is that even if my songs are bad, the message is what is the important part. So just remember the message. And even if I, I die and all, all my YouTube channel is wiped out, the message is still alive and the mess and there's m people all around the world carrying the same message uh, so the message is what is important